All right, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Now, Ephesians chapter 2 is one of the greatest passages in all the Bible. It shows our past, our present, and future as Christians. Now, it shows our past. Actually, our past is not Christians. Nobody is born saved. But it shows our past before we were Christians. In verses 1 through 3, it says, And you hath he quickened, and it says here, who were dead in sins and trespasses. And then it says, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So it begins by telling us our past, uh, when we were all born in sin. You see, the Bible teaches us that everyone's a sinner. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of Adam's sin in the garden, uh, uh, thousands of years ago, we, uh, Adam has, uh, in his sin, he has brought sin upon all men. Romans chapter 5, verse 13, or excuse me, verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And so these verses teach us to begin with our past, that we all have a past. Listen, we all have a past. We all have something that we wish we hadn't done. We all have something that we regret doing in our lifetime. And it says that we were in past, uh, we walked in, uh, we were dead in sins and trespasses. Uh, and, and we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. And it also says that we uh, disobeyed and we walked according to, to the lust of the flesh. We did what the flesh, uh, what the flesh wanted. And so it says we, we all have a past, but not only does Ephesians chapter 2 teach us that we all have a past, it also tells us what we are in our present state as Christians. In verse 5 it says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. Now, that word quicken means to be made alive. In, in verse one, I, I, I yeah, verse one, we see that you have he quickened, and so he tells us that we've been made alive. In verse six, he says, "Hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus." So we see that we have a past, and that past was uh, the fact that we were sinners and we were dead in sins and trespasses. But now it says that we have been quickened by God and we are seated together with God in heavenly places. And the only thing that uh, changes in our, from our past to our present state is 
against God and what He's done in our life. As we look in verse 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us. And so He said, Even though you were dead in sins and trespasses, He made us alive. In other words, He saved us. And thank God, if there, uh, listen, if there's never been a time in your life where you have uh, seen yourself as a sinner on your way to hell, deserving of hell, if there's never been a time where you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're still in those first few verses that I mentioned. But if you have accepted the gift that God has given you and trusted Him by faith to save you, you're in these verses here in our present we see in verses 5 and 6. But then we also see our future. In verse 7, it says that in the ages to come. <laughs> that's our future. In the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. You see, I'm saved forever. And even though these verses teach us that we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, I mean, as far as God's concerned, I'm already there. But as far as we're concerned, we're right here, right now, right? And so one day, we will meet up with the Lord Jesus Christ and we will certainly be with Him in heaven. And so it teaches us not only about our past and our present, but our future. But not only does these verses tell us where we've been, where we are, where we're going, it also shares with us the gift of God. And that's the title of my message tonight is simply this, the gift of God. God has given everyone a gift. And that gift is eternal life. And so you must accept the gift to have eternal life or die in your sins and go to hell. Now it doesn't... I don't stand up here proudly telling you that if you don't accept Christ as your Savior, that you'll die and go to hell. That doesn't make me happy one bit. But I am thankful that we do have the good news that teaches us that if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we can be with Him when we die in heaven. John 10, 28, Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that hath sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So the only thing that can change our past and bring it to the present, which he describes here in chapter 2, is, is accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The only thing that will take away our past, our regrets, our, our, our walking in the lust of the flesh and so forth as it says there, is to accept Him as Lord and Savior. Now I want to ask you this question before we move on. Has there ever been a time in your life where you, your life has been changed by God? Now some people have said, yes, I, I realize that I'm a sinner. That's okay. Some people have said, I know who Jesus is, and that's okay. Some people may have said, hey, I, I, my parents went to church, and, and I went to church with them, and, and, and I, I grew up. Some people have even said, I've always been saved. Well, I've got news for you. No, you're not. No, you haven't been. You see, there must come a time in your life where you uh, make a decision, and you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you. Have you ever prayed a prayer similar to uh, something like this? Jesus, God, I realize that I'm a sinner. I realize that I deserve hell. And I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins and to uh, take me to heaven to be with you. I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly like that, but I'm asking, have you ever made a conscious effort to bow on your knees before God and to ask Him to save you? And then from that moment on, He has changed your life forever. Now listen, I don't remember the prayer that I prayed when I got saved. All I know is that I, is, is that I made a decision that I was going to uh, trust God for salvation. And then my life from that time forth has been changed. Has there ever been a change in your life? You see, that change in your life that I'm talking about 
is what marks the time that you've accepted that gift of, of God, that gift of salvation. And so I want to ask you, has there ever been a time like that in your life? If, there, if it has not been, if you've never made that decision to accept God's gift of salvation, I want to tell you that tonight can be that night. All you got to do is come up to me and say, Pastor, I want to accept Christ as my Savior. I'll take you in the Word of God and show you how to do that. I won't embarrass you, uh, but it's the greatest thing that you'll ever do is accept God's gift. So as we look at this gift of God, let's, let's look and see some things about it. First of all, it is a great gift. It is a great gift. Look again in verse 4, there in Ephesians 2. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love, wherewith He loved us. Did you know that God loves you? The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen, He loved you so much. Now I understand that there's people in this world who believe that nobody loves them. They've been treated down. They've been treated poorly. They've been beaten up and, and abused by other people. And they may have gotten to a place where they believe that nobody in this world, yay, nobody in this universe would even care for them. But I've got news for you. I can tell anybody with complete assurance that God loves you. Amen. Why? Because God died for the world. Amen. He loved you enough to die for you. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Romans 5, uh, 8 says, um, uh, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Listen, God loves you. And here we see that this is a great gift because of His great love wherewith He loved us. 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now listen, that's one reason how I know that you're not saved. you haven't always been saved. Because you ain't always loved God. The Bible says that we didn't love God. We didn't seek Him out. We were lost in sins and trespasses and there was a time in our lives where we realized the love of God toward us and He wanted to save us from a, 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 a eternity in hell. And so we accepted Him by faith. And He gave us, He, he imparted His love into our hearts and now we love God. And we realize the great love that He's given us. But not only has He given us His love, He's given us heaven. Verse 6, remember we just read these in our verses. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now I wish I had time to go into Revelation chapter 21 and to look at how heaven is and how wonderful it is. Maybe sometime take the uh, take that down and open up your Bible and read Revelation 21 about heaven and how wonderful it is. The Bible says in there that there's no more curse. There's no more sorrow. There's no more crying. Hey, there's no more pain. And, dead, and Satan and, 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 and the devil been cast out of heaven there in Revelation 21. Listen, we see how great heaven is. And as far as God's concerned, we're already there. Now, I can't, all, I can't understand all that. But He says He's seated us together. I guess it means the fact that He's given us a place in heaven already. And that all we've got to do is just go there one day. And we know that one day we'll be there. Amen. There's a, there's a place waiting for me. You ever gone to a restaurant, had a reservation somewhere, 
You go in and you say, uh, you, you know, I, you, you, you give them your name and you say, I've got a reservation. You know what? That means they've got a seat waiting for you, amen. Well, hey, praise God. I've got a reservation in heaven. I've got a seat waiting for me. I've got a place waiting for me in heaven. I haven't been there yet, but I'll get there one day, amen. And I'm looking forward to it. Now, some people may say, well, Pastor Wilson, I don't know if there's a reservation waiting for me in heaven. Well, I want to tell you, there's a way you can go. All you got to do is ask me and I'll show you. All you got to do is trust Him as Lord and Savior and He'll make a way for you in heaven. Remember when <laughs> Jesus was on the cross as He was suffering and dying for, for you and for me. There were two thieves that were hanging on the cross, one on one side and one on the other. One of them said, said, Father, remember me when thou goest in thy kingdom. And Jesus said today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. You know what? That thief, he realized that Jesus Christ was the one to save him from his sins. He was probably up there for murder. We know he was a thief, but we know that they committed murder in the resurrection, in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, man, I forget what you call it. Anyway, uh, they were having an uproar and things like that. And, he committed murder. Hey, listen, he deserved to die go to hell. But he said, Jesus, remember me when you go into your kingdom. And you know what? You know what he was asking for? <laughs> he was asking that Jesus to save him. He was asking for a reservation in heaven. And you know what Jesus said? He confirmed his reservation, amen. He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Thank God for that. All you got to do to get into heaven is ask Jesus Christ to save you. But not only is it a great gift, it's a gracious gift. Look at verse 5. It says, Even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. It's a gracious gift. Grace is that unmerited favor we talked about this morning. Things that we don't deserve. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Verse 7, it says that in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace. Verse 8, For by grace are you saved, through faith. Is that not of yourselves? It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. I can't tell you how many times I've knocked on somebody's door and I've asked them, If you die today, do you know if you'd go to heaven? Oh, they say, oh yes, I know that. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know that. And I said, well, if you stand before God, and if He were to ask you, why should I allow you into heaven, what would you say to Him? And so and most, most of the time, people say, well, I'm a good person. I try to do good things for people. And you know what? That's all commendable. But the thing is, is that's not what gets you into heaven. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. That means you can't do it on your own. It says not of works lest any man should boast. You know, if God let one person into heaven by the good works that they've done, He would have to let everybody that ever tried to do any good into heaven. If He let one person into heaven by the good works that they've done, you know what they would say? Look at these streets of glory. I worked all my life for this. That's not going to happen, folks. Because the Bible teaches us when we get to heaven, we'll bow at His feet and we'll praise Him for the fact that He saved us and He died on the cross for our sins. There's no way we can get into heaven on our own. Romans eleven sixteen says, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then there's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What's he saying there? He's saying if you work for it, it's not grace. And he says we are saved by what? Grace. And if you work for it, it's no more grace. But not only is it a gracious gift, it's a generous gift. Look in verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of His grace. 
And so we see that it's a generous gift. Not only does God just give us heaven, but He gives us exceeding riches. Romans 8.32 says, He that spared not his son, how shall and but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He gives us everything we need. 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You see, we have been given exceeding great and precious gifts from the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a story of a man, uh, of, of uh, a king called Mithridates. I may not be pronouncing his name right, but he was a celebrated king in Asia. And this king became interested in an old musician who had taken part in the music performed at a feast in the royal palace. On awakening one morning, this old man saw the tables in his house covered with vessels of silver and gold. A number of servants were standing by who offered him rich garments to put on and, to, and told him there was a horse standing at the door for his use whenever he might wish to ride it. The old man thought it was only a dream he was having. But the servant said it was no dream at all. It was a reality. What is the meaning of it? Asked the, uh, the old man. It means this, said the servant. The king has determined to make you a rich man at once. And these things that you see are only a small part of what he has given you. So please use them as your own. At least he believed, at last, excuse me, he believed what they told him. Then he put on the purple robe and mounted his horse and he rode along and he kept saying to himself, all these are mine. All these are mine. You see, the king made a poor man a rich man. But I'll tell you what, Jesus, because of his generous gift, his gracious gift to us, he's made us kings and priests unto him. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 that we've been made kings and priests. We have everything that we could ever want. You say, well, Pastor Wilson, I don't see you living in a mansion. I don't see you riding a fancy car. I don't see you wearing a $1,000 suit or whatever. No. But I'll tell you, wait till you see me when we get to heaven, amen. I'll be living in a mansion. I'll be walking on the streets of God. You know, I mean, the stuff that they, that they uh, try to mine out of the hills and they're trying to get gold and stuff like that. Listen, we use it for pavement up there. <laughs> That's the place where I'm going. He's given us a generous gift. He says His kindness toward us. I, I don't have time to read all this, I, I, but I want you to get these verses down. It, his, we, God has shown His kindness to man in His obedience and suffering for us. 1 Peter 3.18 he suffered for our sins. In his intercession for us, Hebrews 7.25, he continues to intercede for us. In adopting us into his family, 1 John 3.1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Listen, he's, he's so kind to us that he's adopted us into his family. And we should be called his sons. And also, in giving us victory over death, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, he gives us victory over, over death. Listen, we, we don't have to worry about dying. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you don't have to worry about dying one day because we'll go be with him. And so, it's given. It can't be bought. You see, if I were to give you a gift, Todd, and I say, here, Todd, I want you to have this gift. Now, Todd's thinking, what kind of gun that I would give him? That's exactly what he's thinking. He was like, yeah, you can give me any gun you want to. But if I gave you a gift, Todd, and you said to me, here, Pastor, let me pay you for that gift, it wouldn't be a gift then, would it? It would be insulting, really. 
Somebody tries to give you a gift and you try to pay them for that gift, that would be insulting, wouldn't it? It would no longer be a gift. That's why we just read that verse in Romans where it says that if it's if you work for it, it's not grace. The only way we can be saved is by grace. And so Jesus Christ says that He has given us a gift of eternal life. And if you try to do anything to keep it, or if you try to do anything to get it in the first place, it's not a gift. It's not a gift. It just doesn't work that way. There's no work that you can do to keep yourself saved. There's no work that you can do to save yourself. Acts 8.20 20 says, uh, Peter said unto him, Peter talking to a man, he says, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Listen, I know there's some rich man, rich men in this world today, but you can't buy your way into heaven. <laughs> I mean, you just, you just can't do that. It's not a gift. And you know what? People are working there trying to work their way to heaven. You know, sometimes I knock on somebody's door and they'll open it up and say, you're not Jehovah's Witness, are you? <laughs> you know why? Because the Jehovah's Witness, they knock on people's doors and they're out there, they're trying to work to get themselves to heaven. In, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the Book of Mormon, it says, for we know that we that it is by grace that we are saved after we can do all we can do. After we do all we can do. Then grace kicks in. That goes contrary to God's Word. You know what they've done? They've taken the Word of God and they've perverted it. And they made it seem like, or they made it look like that you've got to do all you can do. And then at the end of that, grace is at the end there waiting. Oh no, my friend. No. You see, we get grace. And then after grace, we do all we can do. Now, does that mean, I, I'm not saying we do all we can do to be saved. But I, what I am saying is that after we receive grace, God wants us to live for Him. And to work for Him. We see that in verse 10. I won't read it right now. But it says that we've been saved under good works. And so, it's... You see, people have it backwards. They want to try to do the work first and then be saved. But then, last of all, it's a good gift. He says, you were dead in sins and trespasses. And then, in verse 3, we had our conversation in time past and the lust of our flesh. So before we were saved, we were not good. We were bad people. But after we get saved, we're to be good. Verse 10 again, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in. You see, salvation makes us a better person. Salvation makes us good. You see, the world tries to get rid of the Bible. The world wants to be rid of Christians, but it's actually Christians who make this world good. And you see, the Bible is good enough to save you. The Bible says that we're saved by this Word of God. It's good enough for, to save me. It's good enough to keep me saved. It's good enough for God. And it's good enough for me. You know, this salvation, this gift that He's given us is as good as, as, as God has given You may say, well, Pastor Wilson, I, I know you're a good man, but you're not as good as God is good. Yeah, but you don't see me the way God says. Do you know that if you're saved in Jesus Christ, you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ on you? Now, you may not see it. But the Bible says that there's a part of us that cannot sin. Now, that doesn't mean we don't sin. But there's a part of us inside of us that don't sin. And as Christ looks on us, He sees His righteousness. It's as good as God is good. And by the way, you can't get no gooder than that. I know that's not correct English. But the thing is, if it's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. I want to read you one more verse. Isaiah 64, 6. But we all is an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. 
We all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. It's saying our righteousnesses, in other words, the things that we do that to try to be good to get us to heaven, there is filthy rags. There is, it's just like taking a filthy rag to God and saying, God, this is why you should allow me into heaven. Your, your works, your filthy works, is just like that filthy rag. Listen, you can't get us to heaven. But because He's given us a great gift, all we have to do is take it and accept it. 2 Corinthians 9.15 says, Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Let's bow our heads and pray.